In our book, we want to encourage readers to think broadly about the ways in which they influence others and exercise leadership roles, regardless of whether they're sort of nominally at the top of some organizational hierarchy. The truth is that leadership manifests itself in all sorts of ways, and those with official leadership titles are only implementing the minority of these important practices. Why did I become an executive coach? I saw lots of great people fail to get ahead at work, while their much less talented peers blew right past them. That made me furious, but also curious. What were great people getting wrong? It came down to helping them re-examine what drove success and then helping them make critical shifts one hard truth at a time. Feel like you're doing everything you were told, but you're not moving ahead at work nor having the impact you seek? Then welcome to 97% Effective with Michael Winderoth, where we skip feel-good, happy talk and engage experts in pointed conversations about what it really takes to move the needle at work and your career. So if you feel stalled or frustrated or seek that extra edge as you move to the next level, then look no further. This is the Hard Truths Playbook you never got. Hi, I'm Michael Wenderoth, and you're listening to 97% Effective. Leaders are meant to motivate, inspire, and change hearts and minds. Do you agree? But what if leading others toward better decisions did not require changing hearts and minds? What if you could make a big impact by making small adjustments that led people to make better decisions, which created better outcomes? Would that be leadership? My guest today says yes, and he's on a mission to expand how we all think about leadership. Don Moore, professor at University of California's Haas School of Business, wants us to include in leadership the ability to help others make wise decisions. As a world expert in decision-making and co-author of the textbook that introduced the field of behavioral economics, Don wants us to see how psychological insights from social science can modify behavior more efficiently than trying to change hearts and minds. To explore this topic, we're going to discuss his latest book, Decision Leadership, Empowering Others to Make Better Choices, written with Max Bazerman. Don Moore, who has been a previous guest on this show, is Associate Dean and holds the Lorraine Tyson Mitchell Chair in Leadership at the Haas School of Business at the University of California at Berkeley. He received his bachelor's degree in psychology from Carleton College and PhD in organizational behavior from Northwestern University. His research interests cover confidence and overconfidence with a focus on forecasting, judgment, and decision-making. Aside from being widely published and cited in the popular media, Don is also the author of Perfectly Confident, which was the subject of our previous podcast I had with him on 97% Effective, and also as co-author with Max Bazerman of Judgment in Managerial Decision-Making, one of the best-selling textbooks in the field. Don, welcome back to 97% Effective. Very much excited to discuss your latest book, Decision Leadership. Thanks, Michael. It is great to be with you again. And might I add a particular joy to see how your talents have evolved since your college radio days. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe we was too overconfident back then (laughs) and I have calibrated it in in different ways here. (laughs) Uh, So, Don, let's talk about your book, and, and you wrote in the outset that you were going to publish a new edition, I think going into the ninth edition of your core de- textbook, Judgment in Managerial Decision-Making with Max Bazerman. Instead, you both decided to publish a new book, Decision Leadership, which is going to be our focus today. So two questions I wanted to ask about this. First, you know, Judgment was published first you know, edition back in 1986 when behavioral economics, uh, you know, was just starting to emerge. I think had it emerged 10 years later or, or <laughs> I probably would have been the field I would have gone into. So now 35 years later, this has been kind of the arc of, of you know, you know, a lot of your professional career in this field of behavioral economics. 
what would you just point out as as being some kind of the major advancements um, that have shaped the field and you know given it the prominence that it has today? Wow, so much to say. Um, it, it's it's worth noting that there have been a lot of great books on the subject. Possibly the most famous of these is Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, which has received a great deal of well-justified attention. It's a wonderful book, but there are many others from Dan Ariely's Predictably Irrational to Chip Heath's book Decisive, um, Richard Thaler's books Nudge and Misbehaving. It is a field that has proven itself broadly influential, not only in academia, but also in popular culture. The idea that human beings are not the perfectly rational agents of classic economic theory, and that we can make better economic theories and we can design better organizations if we take into account not only the rational prescriptions of economics, but also the psychological realities of the, our own limitations and the ways that that leads us to deviate from rational judgment and wise decisions. Mm -hmm. And so you very much lie at the intersection of that coming to it, of course, as a, as a psychologist. Yep. And so why the new book and, and the departure, right? You could have gone ninth edition here, started to integrate that in. I mean, it felt to me like you very much wanted to make this explicit connection of decision making and connecting it to leadership. And you do, you know, hold the leadership chair there at, at, at Haas. But why the departure in the new book? Oh, well, it, it, so the, the old book was a pointy-headed, nerdy textbook that, while influential, reached a fairly niche audience. We felt like the field had evolved to the point where we had a broader message to deliver to a larger popular audience, and in particular, that we wanted to speak to leaders to help them rethink the way that they saw their influence in the organizations that they were leading, and also to help people at all levels of organizations think about their own influence on others and their potential for leadership. So one of the things about leadership uh, is that there is a great deal of diversity with respect to what people think it means. And in our book, we want to encourage readers to think broadly about the ways in which they influence others and exercise leadership roles, regardless of whether they're sort of nominally at the top of some organizational hierarchy. The truth is that leadership manifests itself in all sorts of ways, and those with official leadership titles are only implementing the minority of these important practices. Can you then bring this down to earth? And you do a wonderful job in the book, particularly at the beginning, giving kind of three stark examples and saying, hey, is this leadership? In the traditional definition, it wouldn't be. But to, to give an example here of, you know, kind of your expanded definition that maybe people out there would say, hmm, that's not leadership, but why you would say it is. Yeah. So we begin our, our book with a few examples, uh, Colin Kaepernick and his decision to kneel to signify his peaceful protest of some of the ugly racial inequities that he saw in our country. And that tool, that outlet for expression, and some of the constructive roles that it played in, in giving protesters in the Black Lives Matter movement that followed um, an alternative. I was particularly moved at a protest where instead of throwing rocks at police, the protesters knelt in front of the line of, of riot police. Um, another example that we give in the book is um, Bruce Friedrich, who uh, worked as a as an activist for many years with PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, an organization that is known for its radical stances and provocative behavior. In that role, he did things like throw red paint, standing for blood, on people, uh, fashion models wearing fur coats at gala events. And after engaging in that sort of activity for years and being arrested a bunch of times, he came to the conclusion that his activism really wasn't affecting behavior in a way that actually mattered for the lives of the animals he was trying to protect. And he changed course, started uh, a, an organization called the Good Food Institute, and has devoted his energies to delivering tasty, inexpensive, nutrition, plant-based meat substitutes that, in his estimation, 
has done orders of magnitude more to reduce meat consumption than any of his uh, provocative actions with PETA ever did. The third person that we talk about is a woman named Jessie Wisdom, who I got to know. She's aptly named. She's a a wise woman. Uh, I got to know her uh, when she was studying for her doctorate at Carnegie Mellon University, where I was before UC Berkeley. And um, when she graduated with her PhD, she went to go work at Google and was part of their uh, people innovation lab working with Laszlo Bach that introduced small behavioral nudges that wound up having some uh, very helpful benefits. These are are cheap organizational interventions that can move behavior more than than, uh, more costly interventions uh, might. And and what, what yields that benefit is that they are psychologically wise. They are designed around what we know to be human foibles. A really simple one had to do with the health of Googlers. So Google has an incentive to keep its workers healthy for all sorts of reasons, including the fact that it's providing health insurance for them. And Google is also well known for its free food benefit. So there's a lot of free food available and Googlers routinely gain weight when they join the company. Company, and the company wants to encourage them to promote a healthy lifestyle while at the same time making it a nice place to work and to eat with your colleagues. So what did Jessie Wisdom do? She took the desserts in the cafeteria, which are available in very uh, tempting and unlimited quantities, and put them in opaque containers at the back of the cafeteria. If you want dessert, you can get it and as much of it as you care to eat but you have to go search it out. It isn't like the impulse aisle at the grocery store where it's calling to you temptingly. Instead, it it took some effort to go get it. They also uh, um, used smaller plates in in the cafeterias to encourage people to take smaller portions. And both of these efforts, among others, were successful in helping Googlers uh, control the expansion of their waistlines and keep them a little bit healthier. So small, strategic, deliberate, or in some cases, in the, the example of Kaepernick, you know, visible acts that that shape. And if you think about leadership as you know affecting outcomes, very much fits into that definition. How, how has this message or this been received in what you politely? I saw the expression on your face, kind of said the diverse field of leadership. How's that been received? How's the message been received in corporate and government? Just curious. In our book, we tell a story of a presentation in which people were talking, scholars were talking about behavioral economics and some of the nudges that can influence behavior. So uh, another thing that Google did when Jesse Wisdom was there was to offer Googlers some uh, simple messages on, on retirement savings that increase their savings. It was well known that, that Googlers, like, like many of us, uh, weren't saving enough for retirement. And uh, in this presentation, there was a member of the audience, a, a professor of leadership, no less, who raised his hand and said, anchoring Googlers estimates of the right percentage of their salary to contribute to retirement. Like if leadership is about changing hearts and minds, then little nudges like that, that influence behavior without influencing anyone's beliefs. Does that even count as leadership? And the answer provided at the time, not, not Max or I can't claim credit for this, but um, uh, Cass Sunstein and, and David Labson, two behavioral economists in uh, the law school and the, and the uh, economics department, respectively, at Harvard, responded to this questioner by saying, if leadership is about influencing the behavior of others, if leaders, if leaders seek to matter because they exert a positive influence in the world, then doing so in a way that comes at a small fraction of the cost of changing people's opinions about something, but nevertheless has the exact same desired outcome in terms of changing behavior, we think that qualifies as leadership. And I would agree. Great story. I want to quickly ask you here, Don, because behavioral economics has really 
taken off. You know, now a lot of companies have applied behavioral science units or groups in there. And, and whenever you see a, a, a trend kind of take off, there's the danger sometimes that it goes too far. And I, I did have a previous guest on behavioral scientist, applied behavioral scientist, who said- I love that interview. There is a lot of behavioral science BS, Jason Rhea. And he headed up the global unit at Walmart. And he s- sounded the call here that also, and I, and I believe he cited a, a study that actually came out of Haas that showed the some of this is overblown. Yep. And I, I think there's the piece about, well, you got to replicate things. Yep. Um, that is what your field is. But could you address, you know, is the hype going too far? <laughs> Where is it uh, seem to be really solid? Jason says some of it's common sense, which is fair enough. I think most things, <laughs> when they boil down to it, are. But just a reflection here on that comment. Thank you for that invitation. So yeah, my, my brilliant and wonderful colleagues, um, Stefano Della Vigna and Elizabeth Linos, analyzed the actual effect sizes produced by various organizational nudges. And the fact that uh, many governments and corporations have departments dedicated to apl- applications of behavioral science to their work means that there are real large scale high stakes uh, field studies that we can examine that often produce produce excellent evidence um, helping us to estimate the effect sizes of these interventions and the unsettling realities identified by their studies and that Jason Rio was talking about include the fact that the uh, realized effect size in these actual implementations was usually smaller than the published claims would lead you to expect. So um, if you change the default savings plan for the people in your organization, should you think that it will lead, it'll uh, triple the amount of savings as some published estimates might, um, might lead you to expect? Well, if the research results that get published are those that are most interesting, most surprising, and most impressive, then you have to be aware of the tendency that publication bias is likely to get you an overestimate of those effect sizes. And here, let me draw for you a connection to a topic that we talked about in the last show we did together. If you're selecting people for leadership roles or funding entrepreneurs who express the greatest, the most grandiose and exaggerated claims of what they're going to achieve, you are also selecting those who are most likely to be overconfident, right? So we've got this, what economists would call an adverse selection problem, whereby selecting those that are most extreme, the nudges that seem like they're published claims, wow, you can produce this huge effect with a small intervention, Um, you run the risk of overestimating how much you can do with these sorts of of nudges. So um, yes, it is worth being realistic about um, the effectiveness of small behavioral interventions. Um, And it's easy to overstate their impact. That the greatest risk of that overestimate comes if they come, if they displace other more effective, perhaps more costly interventions. In lots of schools and in many other organizations, leaders have been taken with the some, some of what I suspect are overstated results for belongingness interventions, right? If you're worried that you aren't holding on to the underrepresented demographic groups that you're working so hard to recruit, they leave the organization at higher rates, well, you might be tempted to look for fixes there. There's some, there are going to be some costly and expensive fixes, and there are going to be some cheap, easy fixes. The cheap, easy fixes are like you show them a, an hour-long um, belongingness intervention where you tell them, you belong here, and think that that's going to fix all the structural inequities in our society. Uh-uh. So when those small behavioral nudges crowd out, more costly interventions, I think that that is a problem. But the real upside of these nudges is that they're cheap, right? So you can implement them uh, at at relatively little cost, where like the United Kingdom's treasury collected, this is one of the, the 
success stories that launched the nudge unit within the British government and has inspired uh, so many others, so many other governments to follow suit. Um, with a with a few, uh, a small wording change to the letters sent to tax delinquents, like basically costless. Someone changed a few words in this letter that was going out anyway. Um, they brought in millions, tens of millions dollars of, do of pounds in tax revenues that they otherwise would have had to like chase these people down and, and threaten them with legal action, um, a, a much more costly intervention. So the promise of these nudges is that well, wisely designed nudges can produce um, beneficial outcomes at relatively low cost. And that promise persists even if we are at risk of overestimating their actual consequences. Mm. Yeah, so I'm hearing be skeptical. That doesn't mean they're not effective or they're not worth trying. Jason Rhea continues to work in the area despite <laughs> his own skepticism. There's value he, there. Yeah, he does. And but I'm hearing it, you know, as the wise words from from you in our in our previous episodes, be skeptical, but also test track measure. Yep. That's really key. So we can see if it's happening. Yeah. And a word here, so, sorry to interrupt, but I, this is an opportunity yeah. to talk about experimentation, which uh, Max and yeah. I advocate very enthusiastically in our book. As a, an organizational leader, sometimes it's ironically, it can be easier to get consensus around the implementation of some new practice for onboarding new employees, say, rather than to conduct an experiment testing the effectiveness of different onboarding practices. But if you're skeptical of the effectiveness of the new nudge or belongingness intervention you want to implement, you need to test it. You can't just buy it hook, line, and sinker and believe that like the prior published claims are all true. No, you want to test it in your organization. Does it actually work for the sort of people and the sort of uh, work challenges that they're facing? You should run an experiment. And, and CEOs and leaders in corporate America should take this lesson to heart and run more experiments, testing things out. In tech, the companies have gotten much more comfortable testing, running experiments on their customers, right? When you show up to Amazon, they're always running randomized trials, comparing different web interfaces and seeing um, what which ones make it easier for customers to buy. But organizations could benefit from running a lot more experiments. And and when you say experiments, to, to define that a little more, we're talking about an A-B experiment with a control group and then the one that has the intervention where you're trying to hold everything equal exactly. to get the, the, the best data exactly. there so there's not other confounding effects. In yep. That. And key to an okay. experiment is randomization to condition. You can't assign all the African-American hires to the belongingness intervention and all the white ones to the control group and think that you can draw a valid conclusion. You have to randomly assign people to the different conditions, the experimental group and the control group. And only then can you infer that it was differences in that treatment that actually produced the different outcomes you care about. Yeah. You've been listening to 97% Effective with your host, executive coach, Michael Winderoff. If this interview is making you think, make sure to share it with a friend. Now, back to our interview. You've raised a lot here around uh, kind of what's at stake or the benefit that we can get from, from interventions. And, and you recently wrote this article, well, last year, that very much sounded the alarm. It was kind of a look back at the pandemic response, our government's response. And so... There is this kind of lore of overconfident leaders. And that article was so good. I'm going to put it in the show notes. But do you want to call anything out here? Because this lure of overconfidence, we get the overconfident leaders and boom is, you know, yes. a lot of big weighty decisions that affect millions could be at stake. So I like that article so much. I wanted you to invite you here to, to speak about it. That's very kind of you. I, I think the article highlights some of the dilemmas more than uh, easy fix solutions to the problem. I mean, if we elect leaders or promote candidates or fund projects based on what their champions say about how likely they are to succeed or the benefits that they will yield, which makes total sense, right? We want leaders who are going to do great things. 
then we are at risk of um, voting in or promoting those who are overconfident, who have promised too much. Okay, so recognizing this dynamic as a voter, as a corporate board member, as an investor, as a VC should make you skeptical of grandiose claims. What should you do instead? Well, sometimes you're in a position where you can actually ask the contender, the candidate, the entrepreneur to um, commit to what it is that they say that they're doing, that, they, that they're going to achieve. Um, one small example that we give in the book has to do with a VC hearing promises from confident entrepreneurs about future revenues. Okay. You think that revenues are going to quadruple in a year and that it's going to justify a um, $8 per share valuation on our $100 million investment. Okay. Let's make a bet on that. If sales have grown as you project, we'll take that valuation. If sales are fall short of that, we want our investment to be worth a greater percentage of your company. This, you want to structure this bet in a way that allows the person on the other side to bet on what they say they believe. If they're right, if they really believe it, they should be eager to take your bet. This sort of uh, contingent contract holds the opportunity to reveal exaggeration because if they don't really believe what they're saying, they should be scared to take your bet. What would that look like in the political realm? Or, or they, it's not as <laughs> much harder, harder to much design harder. there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as a voter, you'd like to love uh, it, but to yeah, here's some track record, a proven track record, and and try to pin the candidate down to some very specific predictions of what what they will or won't be able to achieve. Mm. But as, a, as an individual voter, <laughs> it's hard to hold a presidential candidate's feet to the fire that way. Right, right. So your book, Don, you reference it as almost a utility belt. I love thinking about this, kind of the Batman utility belt, where you've got different pieces in terms of architecture, things that you can do to frame decisions, to create culture, systems, processes that draw on all of your body of work and research. To, to pick a few that, that we may have time for. The first one, and this is a question that I wanted to get to when I was reading your previous book, Perfectly Confident, and we did not get to in the previous interview, which was very much everything you talk about here is being deliberate, being systematic, putting processes in place to get better outcomes and calibrate confidence, get better forecasts. And that very much contrasts against intuition, Okay. You know, in my gut, I know when I know I've seen the pattern so many times before and perfectly confident didn't really address that straight on. I didn't feel like that. Your new book does. And I was pleased to see that when I read it because I love him, but I know you guys attack him. Malcolm Gladwell in his book blink. So when that came out, that captured the imagination and attention of a generation of leaders. This one, honestly, and I'll admit it included, and just to quickly summarize, right, Blink touts the power and wisdom of intuition, this idea of thin slicing your, your gut to make good decisions, which would very much seem to fly in the face of a lot of things that, that you talk about, that you preach. So I was really trying to, oh boy, how do I reconcile these two? And then you smack on in chapter two address this. And Gladwell has been kind of smacked down on this by a lot of you guys. Can you unpack this, you know, for us, deliberation versus intuition and how we ought to be thinking about this. What is really evidence-based? Thank you. Thank you for that invitation. In your diplomatically worded question, Michael, you are giving voice to the objections of generations of my students <laughs> who say, come on, you egg-headed <laughs> professor. I can't sit down and do an expected value calculation with probabilities and utilities in a spreadsheet for every single lousy decision I make. I'm a busy manager and I've got a, m more decisions in front of me than I can process deliberatively. Give me a break. It's true, of course, that, uh, that we make small decisions routinely 
And the truth is that intuition serves as a very, very useful guide. So Gladwell, love him. He is a brilliant writer who is so good at marshalling, compelling, fascinating, fun stories that um, he can sometimes be a little bit too good at making the case for which the evidence isn't all there. He, uh, and, that, and that is what academics took him to task for. In the first half of his book, Blink, he makes the case for intuition. And I would say much of what he says is right. Intuition is powerful. It is powerful in ways that conscious deliberation is not. Our intuitive minds are incredibly powerful uh, parallel processors where our unconscious minds are doing so many things all at once that are outside of conscious awareness. They are processing breathing, body temperature, digestion, heart rate, balance, attending to massive amounts of data input from our ears, from our eyes, from our senses of smell and touch, more data than we can possibly process consciously. And so they make our lives very simple and intuitive gut guidance is often quite good. It processes a lot of data and evidence that sometimes we might not, we might have difficulty processing, accounting for and justifying consciously, logically. It is also possible to train intuition Gladwell's magical 10,000 hours isn't quite as clear a, a threshold as, as one might think uh, based, on, based on his books, but um, it is nevertheless the case that seeing patterns over and over and over can make experienced professionals' uh, intuitions better, especially under circumstances where you're getting a lot of clear, immediate feedback that helps you hone your intuitive sense of the relevant inputs and helps you make better decisions. And this is a message delivered in the second half of Gladwell's book, which is not as thoroughly remembered as the first half of his book. Intuition is not perfect. It is biased in predictable ways. There are things that are more salient or memorable or evocative or powerful for intuition than they ought to be. Recency effects are more powerful. Salient examples or memorable um, instances stand out and are intuitively compelling in ways that they shouldn't be. What's the probability of you experiencing an earthquake living in the San Francisco Bay Area? Well, you can bet after the 89 quake that people were much more anxious about quakes than they are now in, with several decades without a major quake. Well, so people buy, want to buy more earthquake insurance after an earthquake. The actual risk of earthquake goes down after a big quake. Um, it is, it, there's predictable ways in which our intuitions will guide us imperfectly. And it is in those circumstances, if you want to figure out whether you should buy earthquake insurance, you should sit down and attempt to calculate the probability of an earthquake, the, the cost of an earthquake, the cost of insurance, the probability that the insurance will be there and will actually cover you for your losses in the case of a quake. These are all sort of more rational analyses. How scared you feel about the possibility of a quake is only weakly informative about the value of purchasing earthquake insurance. When the stakes are high, it's worth doing a systematic analysis. And that's going to be the tiny minority of instances. And when you say this, systematic analysis, my mind is going to this, and I want to ask you this, Don, because you are there in the heart of Silicon Valley, and we are in the period with AI algorithms, the power of machines, and it would strike me here as we think about this, that you know, deliberate, not making mistakes, not being susceptible to bias unless it's programmed in, machines would be quite good at this, right? They're not emotional, robo-investing, et cetera. And so I'm interested in your perspective here because you sit in this field and you're sitting there right where you know all of this is happening in terms of AI. Humans, technology, decisions, I mean, are you seeing how this might be combined? Are machines going to take over? Would they be better at this in practice? I know I've just dumped a lot on you there, but <laughs> say whatever you want on this because I think you've got a very interesting perch in perspective. Yeah, there is a long history that goes back well before the advent of smart systems like GPT 
that document some of the strengths of algorithmic decision models. In particular, they can offset some of the weaknesses of human intuition. So intuition is notoriously inconsistent, depending on what side of the bed you got up that day, what the weather is, you'll feel differently about the options in front of you. Whereas a, an algorithmic decision model does not, it is not biased by some of those same things. Now, depending on how you train your model, if what you're training it on is to systematically implement human judgments as guided by prior admissions decisions, prior parole decisions, things like that, then you have to worry about those models building in undesirable human biases, such as race biases, which have been evident in some analyses of, for instance, parole decisions. Okay, so are algorithmic decision models perfect? Certainly not. Are they useful supplements to human judgment? Yes, often they are. And um, some of the human biases that uh, can be trained in unintentionally into automated systems can be sometimes easier to train out of them as well. Because if you can identify exactly the ways that your algorithmic decision heuristic is biased, you can counteract that very intentionally in a way that it's really hard to counteract human intuitions, right? To tell the judge, listen, it seems like you're paying attention to extraneous factors like race of the suspect and zip code from which they came. Like, it's going to be harder for the judge to figure out how to counteract that in their own intuitions than you can counteract it in the, in the algorithmic parole model that you've built. A fascinating future in this area. Um, so we'll have a future podcast to t talk about this. I, I want to jump to this there's a chapter five of using the advice of others. And there's just this obvious question that I kind of, you know, I was thinking about this of like, you know, if we're all <laughs> overconfident or, or, or biased in lots of ways, it would actually kind of feel a little bit like if I ask others, it's going to amplify or it's going to cause, you know, more problems. And I know that you talk about in the book, things average out uh, the, the kind of wisdom of crowds, be careful of mobs. But, you know, how do you, and, and then also, okay, go get some advice from experts, but experts have notoriously been shown to also be, make mistakes, stock pickers, for example, or managed funds. So help us reconcile this in terms of how you get advice from others, but that doesn't amplify the problems and the forecasting, but instead it calibrates it. Great, great question. So if you ask each of the experts that you're consulting for advice, how sure they are that they're right, it may be the case, as you suggest, that they systematically overestimate the chances that they're right. And when all of these experts who are sure that they're right disagree with one another, <laughs> they can't all be right. And that'll be obvious immediately in the advice that you get. Wait, all of these people, they give me really tight confidence intervals, and their confidence intervals don't overlap. They all disagree with each other. What does that imply about how sure I should be? Well, they can't all be right. If I'm at risk of being wrong like they are, I better broaden my confidence intervals, think more more widely about this. So um, if, if the idea of going to seek advice sounds complicated and labor intensive, let me just offer a few thoughts on easy ways that organizations and managers can implement the advice that we're giving, that they should listen to advice. You can listen to other people by inviting their input, soliciting that input, and doing so in a way that prevents them from contaminating one another. You go into an important meeting to make a decision, whether that's who to hire or whether to fund a big project proposal. Well, if the key issue there is how much money this project is going to make, is it going to succeed or is it going to fail? You want to sharpen that question. What are revenues, what are annual revenues going to be three years out? Invite people to show up to that meeting. Maybe you send them a link to an online survey that they complete before coming where everyone submits their estimate, maybe a confidence interval around it. If you can't do that, maybe you open the meeting by posing this question and inviting everyone to write down a guess. Then you share all those guesses and invite people to discuss. 
that is an incredibly revealing exercise that should help you. It, it'll, it'll identify the, the many differences that there are within the group and open the way to exploring those differences in a way that, that helps you bring down your certainty that you know what's going to happen and maybe um, build in smart hedge, hedging bets that, that where you think through, oh, if this fails or if it turns out that it's fabulously successful against our predictions, like, can we handle that? Very practical. Don, as, as usual in our conversations, we're running up at, at time here. And so while there would be more that I would want to talk about the book, I would turn it over to you and say, is there any other section or point that you'd like to emphasize around decision leadership? Again, a huge utility belt that people can draw from, but anything that you would point to as a final closing Sure. In, in our book, we, we work hard to remind leaders of the role that they play, setting the ethical tone for the organizations that they lead. That well-intentioned leaders often think they're demonstrating their hard-headed determination to achieve success by saying, do whatever it takes to hit your numbers. And when they put that sort of pressure on their employees and turn a blind eye to the methods that they use in order to achieve those results, they can wind up unintentionally putting pressure on their employees to cut corners, to exaggerate, to misstate the numbers. And any leader who, who cares about, who has an ethical compass, who would like the, their organization to behave in ways that they can be proud of, should want to build systems that make it easy for their employees to behave ethically. So that's what the decision leadership and the way we articulate it is all about. You build systems to make it easy for people to choose wisely, to make choices that are consistent with the interests of themselves, the organization, their teams, and the larger society of which we're a part. In doing so, they um, expand the pie in the sense that they're making decisions that, that are better for the organization and the, the larger community. Those are the sorts of systems all of us should feel good about implementing. I'm glad you brought up the point around ethics. It is the one that I wanted to cover, and you have just addressed it. But I, I will say here that even the most ethical people in an organization that has systems and incentives, it is it is very hard to break free from that unless they leave. So the importance of leadership and design there, critical. And your book very much dedicates a chapter to strategies to use there. Don, what is next for you? You've got so many things that you have worked on over the years. There must be something that's going to come up in three to five years. Is there a, <laughs> is a big question that's in your mind that you're working on? In your overly generous introduction, you mentioned the, the role that I'm occupying at the moment. The, the dean, Anne Harrison, whose leadership I admire deeply, came to me and asked me if I would serve as associate dean. And when she did so, I said, I love my teaching and my research. And if I say yes to your invitation, I'm not going to be able to do those jobs as well. She looked me in the eye and said, you can't pick the moment when greatness calls. <laughs> so now I find myself in the job of associate dean trying to implement some of the leadership lessons I've written and taught about for so long. And it is an inspiring and worthy challenge. So taking a leadership role in this institution that I love so much is something that I struggle with and take joy in every day. Well, Haas is incredibly lucky to have you Look forward to you reflecting on uh, what you're able to also achieve there as a leader, as an associate dean, a very fine and great institution. Don, how do people reach you, follow you, connect to you, see your work? Most accessible way to reach me is through my books. So pick those up. Thank you for plugging those. Courageous listeners might look up some of my published uh, scholarly work, and that ranges in accessibility in it from all sorts of different outlets. They can they can read about my or see lists of, of my published work on my website, learnmore.org. And if they are motivated to do so, they can come to the Haas School and participate in some of our executive education programs in which I teach regularly. You, Michael, have been the beneficiary of these programs yourself. Yeah, this fantastic education programs. I, I highly recommend them. Don Moore, Associate Dean, Professor at the Haas School of Business, University of California, Berkeley. 
So happy to have you not once, but twice here on 97% Effective. Thank you so much for your time. My privilege. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. Thanks for listening to 97% Effective, where we skip happy talk and help you break through and ascend one hard truth at a time. Help others discover this show. Leave a review and rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you like what you heard, you can get free resources, including the first chapters of Michael's book, Get Promoted, on his website, www.changwinderoth.com. That's www.changwenderoth.com.